Hello, and welcome to another virtual lesson. Today we're going to be looking at internal and external forces. We're going to start with internal forces. Make sure you have your reading sheet so you can follow along. Now an internal force is a force that affects structures um, from the inside. Okay. Uh, it's the stress that structures feel when there is a load on them, and there are four different types. The first of which is tension. Tension is a pulling force that stretches structures, and it can cause an object to increase in length. Tension is opposite to compression. Things in tension tend to be thin. So tension is a pulling force. It stretches them. It makes them longer, like stretching the string on a bow and arrow there, pulling your laces, tug of war. Those are all examples of things that are in tension, and things that in tension tend to be thin. So it will do quite well when it doesn't need to be thick to be successful against tension. Think of an elastic band. You're pulling, you're stretching on that. It's increasing in length, and it does quite well. It, it resists that tension on there. One of the interesting things about tension is if you look very carefully at, say, cable bridges, or even this single piece of string here, it's not one single cord. It's actually made up of several very, very small strands. And those strands are made up of smaller strands. And those strands are made up of smaller strands. It keeps getting smaller and smaller. And all of that is spreading that pulling force. And it's able to resist that and be successful in tension. Our next force is compression. Compression is a pushing force that squashes structures. And compression will cause an object to decrease in length. Things in compression tend to be thick. So that's a pushing force. It compresses them. Uh, think about pushing a spring. You can push it and shrink it, and that's compression. But if you pull it and stretch that spring, that's in tension. Uh, think of your pillow at night, your mattress. Think of how thick an elephant's legs are. They need to be thick because they're in massive amounts of compression because an elephant is humongous. Think of a flamingo. A flamingo's legs aren't as thick as an elephant's. They're considerably thinner. They don't need to be as thick as an elephant's because a flamingo is much lighter. It doesn't, it doesn't need to have big, thick legs to support the compressive force of its huge body. It's a bird. It's extremely light. Think of the bottom of your shoes. You know, dress shoes and high heels aren't as comfortable. They have very thin soles, whereas your running shoes are designed for compression, to squish under the load of your body. Think about your body. Think about the bones in your legs as compared to the bones in your arms. They're thicker because they're under compression. Your arms don't need to be in compression as much as your legs are. So compression is that pushing force. It's opposite to tension, which is a pulling force. Now compression and tension can work together. Let's look at the next one. Compression and tension are two internal forces that act together in many structures and can cause them to bend. The outside of the bend is in tension, pulling. The inside of the bend is in compression, pushing. So inside and outside of bend, what, what the heck do we mean by that? Well, think of if we had a beam bridge here, and you know, it was a, uh, just a log across a, a gap. We have someone come out and walk along it. If they have enough force, they will cause it to bend. Now, look at that bridge as it bends. Or think of a trampoline, jumping up and down on a trampoline as, as you go. It's bending. That structure is in tension and compression. That's easy to understand, but which side is in tension and which side is in compression? Well, in this case, the top here, the inside of the bend, is in compression. On the underside here, it's in tension. It's pulling. Right here, let's say we had an arch bridge. Right there, the top would be in tension and the bottom, the inside of the bend, would be in compression. But we can't really see that happening uh, at this level where? Well, luckily, you can use your hand to help you with that. Put your hand flat, and I want you to do this right now. I want you to pinch the skin on the top of your hand. You'll notice you can get a kind of little flap of skin on your knuckle there. Now, what I want you to do is I want you to curve your hand like this, make a little dome. Now, if you go to pinch the skin again, you can't get as much. Why? Because the top of the skin is in tension. It's pulling. It's stretching. So if up here is in tension, then under here must be in compression. 
And if you look right there, you'll see the skin is all squished together because it's compressing together. Look at that. Put your lay your hand flat and you pull it together and like, oh, you're, and your skin all squishes together there. So you have tension and compression there. So anytime you see, in, uh, see a curved structure, you can figure out which way where the tension and compression is. You see a tree blowing in the wind like this. Oh, well, there's tension and compression. I see an arch bridge. Oh, there's tension and compression. Someone's jumping on a trampoline. Oh, well, there's tension and compression. Use your hand to help you figure that out because you can, in your hand, you can actually physically feel and see the tension and compression occurring, unlike a meter stick. Let's look at our next force, torsion. Torsion is the force that twists or rotates structures. It is a push or a pull in a circular motion. So it's twisting, turning. It's still a push or a pull, because remember all forces are either just a push or a pull, but it's in a circular motion there. Uh, think of a doorknob. Think of starting a car. Uh, we have the examples of a screwdriver or wringing out a towel. That's twisting and turning there. Pedaling a bicycle. That's another example as well. Uh, we humans actually do quite well with uh, uh, torsion because of the setups of our arms. We have three bones in our arms here. Uh, humerus, uh, the radius, and the ulna. Now the radius and the ulna are, are down here. Now what I want you to do is I want you to put your hand on, on one side here. Lay your hand flat, put it right there. Now watch this. We're going to do a magic trick. Keep your finger on there. Presto, change out. Oh, look at that. I flipped the bones. I, well, I didn't actually flip their position. I just turned them over one another. Our forearms are capable of torsion, of twisting, because the two bones in it allow it to turn. So it makes us pretty good at, you know, turning things. Well, of course, that sounds kind of silly, but could you imagine if we only had one bone in our forearm there? We'd be kind of stuck like this. We would suck at turning things. It wouldn't be very good. Doorknobs would never have been invented. We'd all be handles. You know, we wouldn't have steering wheels. We'd have some sort of pulley, push and pull system. Luckily, we have two bones there that allow us to twist and turn and apply a torque or a torsion force on, on a structure or an object. We humans are pretty good at turning things. And finally, we have shear. Uh, shear is the force that pushes or pulls in opposite directions. It pushes, pulls, or tears a structure apart. The force moves in opposite and parallel directions. So opposite directions and parallel directions there. So it's, uh, this is one of the trickiest ones to get. The most common tool we use for shearing things are scissors because they move in opposite and parallel directions. And then you have bigger scissors and we call them shears. I, I, I don't know why shears are called shears and scissors are called scissors because both of them shear things using a scissoring motion. Uh, they could both be called scissors, they could both be called shears. I don't know why we call them different things there. So it moves in opposite and parallel directions. Sort of the same thing with tearing a page. You, if you took a piece of paper and you moved in opposite and parallel directions, you would shear it. You could move in opposite and parallel directions and you would shear it. So I could take it and opposite, parallel, I'm shearing it. Opposite, parallel, I'm shearing it. So, uh, another common tool is you know, those electric shears, you know, when you like shave your head in the morning or whatever, you know when you do that. Uh, those are called shears as well, but they don't seem to scissor. Well, they have two sets of uh, blades, two sets of teeth that move back and forth. They shear things. You put a hair in between those two uh, objects and it will go back and forth and shear it. It'll split it. It's like a whole bunch of tiny little scissors zipping back and forth there. That's why those electric clippers, those buzzers are called shears because they do shear things. Not like we're used to thinking about with scissors. So those are our internal forces. They affect structures from the inside. All right. It is the stress that structures feel. Right now, your chair is feeling tension and compression because of you sitting on it. It's it's it, you know might feel a torsion, a torquing motion as you turn and twist the back. But it's what structures feel. Your body feels those things. Your your legs feel compression as gravity pulls down on it. So now let's look at external forces. External forces are forces that affect structures from the outside, the loads that go on structures. There are two types of external structures, the first of which are live loads. Live loads, they're a force on a structure that are variable and change regularly. So right now, you are a live load on your chair. 
Uh, you are weighing down that chair. Because you are sitting on that chair, you as an external force, you are feeling that you are causing that chair to experience internal forces. The legs are in compression. The, the seat that you're sitting on is in tension and compression as you push down on it. Some other examples include strong winds, you know, blowing on a tree. Look at that, tension and compression there. Uh, impact forces, hitting a ball with a bat. You, know, you hit that ball, that ball will compress slightly as that ball hits it. Uh, objects on or within a structure. A snow on a roof, cars on a bridge, you right now in the school. This is one of the, the most interesting things I like to think about. All those live loads that are you know, on like an apartment building especially. Think right now, an apartment building is pretty empty. You know, kids are at school, parents are at work. You know, come three, four, five o'clock, everyone comes home. That's literally hundreds of people entering that building. That load is packing onto that building. It's a live load. It's changing. Then you get a new couch. There's a new live, live load. Then you get a whole bunch of groceries. There's a whole new live load on your fridge and on the whole apartment building. And then it's Friday night. You have a party. Like a hundred people show up. We're all jumping up and down and partying. No one worries about the floor collapsing or the building tipping over because it's unbalanced because that structure is designed to handle live lows, not just of you and your party and your couch and the food in your fridge, but also of winds pushing on it. It can handle that external force of a live load that's continuously changing. It's variable. In a couple of minutes, you're going to stand up from that chair and you're going to move and there's going to be a new load on that chair. It's different. It's variable. It changes. Those are the external forces of live loads. Then we have dead loads. Dead loads are the weight of the parts of the structure. They do not change very often. So for example, so, so think about a structure. It's the parts that hold it together. Think back to the apartment building. You, your fridge, your couch, your TV are all live loads on that apartment building. But the bricks, the wood, the nails, the windows, those are all dead loads. They are parts of the structure that hold it together. They don't really change. They're static. They can change. Sure, we can, you know, knock out a wall, we can add new supports, we can change the windows, but they don't change very often. So dead loads are static, the parts that hold the structure together. Think of a bicycle. Well, let's think of the dead loads on a bicycle. Well, we got the wheels, the frame, the seat, the handlebars, the brakes. Those are all parts of the structure. Think of the live loads that are on a bicycle. Well, you, to begin with, wind blowing on you as you're trying to pedal along. Those are all live loads. Uh, think of yourself. Think of the live loads that are on your body. Your clothes, a hat, your backpack weighing you down. Those are all live loads. Those change. Think of the dead loads that your body supports. Think of the bones and muscles that every single second of every single day, the structure of you has to support. So if it's not a physical part of the structure, then it's a live load. The, the, the table that we're sitting at right now, you know, you might be leaning on it. You're a live load on this table. The things that I have on this table are live loads on this table. But the table top is a dead load. The legs are a dead load. The bolts that hold it together are all a dead load. They're all there uh, together, parts of the structure. So the table has to support itself. Then it also has to support the live load of the things that we put on it. As a result of these dead loads and live loads, it feels the internal forces. The legs feel compression. You know, right now, the center of this table is feeling tension and compression. Uh, some of the parts of the structure feel torsion as we put the screws in to assemble the legs. It feels those internal forces. So those are external and internal forces. Thanks for watching.